Pergamon. And they're over here. The first is a seat. This is the shape of the old Roman governor seat they sat on. And you see it's uncomfortable because they didn't want them to sit too long. <laughs> the second is a sword. And the third is a stone with writing on it. Those in the back row can read the writing, can't you? We're going to start with the sword. Now this is my grandfather's bayonet and it's from 1908, so it's over 100 years old. And the reason I've brought it is because I don't have a Roman sword. <laughs> I don't have the short sword or the long sword. And we're talking about in our passage, the long sword. The Roman long sword was wielded by a legionary, but the sword we're reading about today comes out of Jesus' mouth. That's amazing technology, isn't it? He was way, way ahead of, of all these amazing movies you see about Star Wars and other stuff. So we're going to look at this passage today, and it's about a sword. And I was tempted just to blunt the sword a bit so I could stroke you with a sword rather than stab or cut. But these are Jesus' words, and they're sharp. Sharp words that come out of his mouth, and I'm really glad we saw all those pictures about Jesus' love because about halfway through you're going to think Jesus does not love us. But he's only doing it because he loves us. Just like a mother when your child runs across Bang Street, you don't say, oh, I don't want to give my daughter a fright. I'll just let her risk it with the traffic and pray that she gets across. You scream at her. You run after her. You grab her by her arm. You yank her out and say, what do you think you're doing? You don't do that because you hate her, you do it because you love her. Jesus has some sharp things to say, not because he hates us, because he loves us and he wants to save us from ourselves. So I'd like you just to stand as we read God's word together. Out of reverence for these actual words of Jesus. These are not my words, these are not made up words, these are the actual words of Jesus. Revelation 2 verse 12, And to the angel of the church at Pergamon write, These things says the one who has the sharp two-edged sword. I know your works, and where you stay, where Satan's throne is, so you see the sword and the throne, or the seat, and you hold fast to my name, and did not deny my faith, even in the days in which Antipas was my faithful martyr, who was killed among you, where Satan dwells. But I have a few things against you. Because you have there those who hold the doctrine of Balaam, who taught Balak to put a stumbling block before the children of Israel or set a trap for the children of Israel, to eat things sacrificed to idols and to commit sexual immorality. Thus you also have those who hold the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which I hate. This is heavy stuff. Repent. Or else I will come to you quickly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. And here comes a tricky bit. He or she who has the ear to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says to the churches. But here's the good news. To the one who overcomes, I will give the hidden manna and a white stone on which a new name is written that no one knows except the one to whom it is given. Thank you. May God bless his reading of his word and please have a seat. Now you've been looking at this weird picture. We can go back to the first one actually. Just for a moment. And I'll move on to that soon. And it talks about a sword. And I want you to picture the Roman governor sitting on his throne and pretend you're a Christian who's standing before the Roman governor and he's listening to your case. The chair is hard. He doesn't want to stay there too long. He wants to judge you and get in and have lunch. He's holding a sword like this. And your eyes are watching him all the time. Because as long as he's holding the sword, you could live. But when he's watching you and he does this, it's over. That's his sign 
you're going to have the death sentence. So the Christians are scared of this person, this Roman governor, because he's quite terrifying. But Jesus is saying to them, don't be scared of them. I am the one who has the, white, the sharp sword with two edges. I'm the ultimate power in the universe. He may rule the province of Asia, which is the province of Turkey these days, where Pergamum is, but I rule the entire universe. I rule it with my sword. Fear not. And then in Revelation chapter 19, verse 15, we read these wonderful words where John says, And look, I saw heaven opened. And look, a white horse, and the one who sat on it, with eyes like a flame of fire, many crowns on his head. His name is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and makes war. And behind him the armies of heaven on white horses, and dressed in clothes clean and white. And out of his mouth comes a sharp two-edged sword, with which he will strike the nations. All those evil governors, all those evil leaders that have caused so much trouble, that have committed genocide, Jesus will judge them. They haven't got away with it. Their time is coming. But on his cloak and on his thigh is a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. We started with a psalm this morning. There's none like God among the gods. All the gods people worship today cannot compare with Jesus, King of kings and Lord of lords. So don't fear the proconsul who sits in the seat. Fear the one who has the sword. But then he goes on in the next verse to say, I know your works and where you stay, even where Satan's seat is. But you've hold fast my name and have not denied my faith, even in the days when my faithful martyr Antipas was killed among you, where Satan dwells. And now we, go, we move from the sword to the throne, or the seat, because we want them all to start with S. So we've got a sword, a seat, and a stone. What is it like to live where Satan's actual throne is? What is that all about? Well, if you are in Germany any time, go to Berlin and go to Museum Island to what I think is the best museum in the world, the Pergamum Museum. What church are we doing today? Pergamum. There's a building there that comes from Pergamum. It's over 2,000 years old. How did it get inside that building? Well, in the 1800s, it was perched on top of a mountain in Turkey. And the locals were taking marble and, and, and stone from the building site to build their own houses. And the German archaeologists working there were worried that this valuable treasure was going to disappear and become villas and shopping centers and all sorts of other things. So they got permission to move it. And they're amazing people. What they did is they removed each piece, like all those beautiful sculptures. They take each piece and label it, X5726. Put them in boxes, ship them all the way across the sea to Berlin, put them inside the Museum of Pergamon, and then it was like a giant Lego set. They reassembled this 2,000-year-old building, and today you can wander around there. And you'll see the steps going up. It looks like a giant armchair. You can picture someone sitting there resting their arms on the armrests. You can go up the steps to the top where they worshipped Zeus, king of the gods, and they offered sacrifices to him. Now you want to picture it on top of the mountain. So if you look at the next picture, some very smart person has photoshopped that building and stuck on the top of the hill. So that's what it looked like. And I want you to picture Satan sitting on his throne in his armchair, puffing his pipe. Because 24-7, black smoke would belch up from the altar of Zeus. It would hang over Pergamon like an eerie, de dreadful, dead presence. But it wasn't just 
this altar of Zeus that was on top of that mountain. The next picture shows us that that hilltop actually swarms with satanic temples. Um, there's so many of them, and I kept the sword for this reason because I can't quite reach and I'll probably still have to jump. That is the altar of Zeus, that little one there. All the rest are other satanic temples. I don't have time to tell you all about them, but I can tell you about a couple. This one I like because it's a medical temple. It is where the god Asclepius was worshipped. And I call him the god with a snake on the stick. Because in this temple, the worship goes to Asclepius. And I want you, you know, nowadays when you go to a clinic, you can look online and they'll show you your patient experience as you go through the clinic. So this would be your patient experience if you were a patient going there. You'd arrive at the door of this temple and there's a big sign, death does not enter this building or no death inside this building. And you would see an elderly person who's very sick being calmly escorted away saying, sorry, uh, this is not the place for you. You're terminal. You're going to ruin our statistics. Off you go. If you were looking pretty okay and you're like, you might survive the experience, you were escorted inside. When you got inside, these kind priests gave you very powerful drugs. And as you drank them, you started to feel weird, like you were floating and really bizarre. And then they escorted you down a long passage to a room full of snakes. This is a nice clinic, this. But you're so high on the drugs they've given you that you don't really notice. And you lie down on the cold stone floor and these slithering snakes can crawl all over you, around you, everything else. Because they believe the snakes have healing powers. I don't see any volunteers for this clinic as yet. <laughs> and you're about 2,000 years too late anyway. When you come down from your trip, the priest is there taking notes. And the priest is saying, what were your dreams about? You tell them the dreams, they say, aha, I'll give you a prescription for this herb, for this potion, or maybe a small operation. Then out of gratitude, you make a little clay model of the part of the body that's been healed. And you'll see the different parts of the body, legs, arms, and maybe other parts they're not showing you, but all on those walls, which is showing your gratitude to the god Asclepius, the god with the snake on the stick. But the best part of all, if you look at this long, gloomy corridor, you'll see this interesting corridor, and have you noticed there's some holes in the roof? So you've had your healing experience, and you're walking down this corridor, and you hear this voice saying, You are healed. You are healed. You are healed. And you look up at the hole in the roof, and there's a priest. You are healed. So it was a holistic experience. You got surgical treatment, medical treatment, satanic treatment, psychotherapy, telling you you're much better, and you also probably survived because they would usher you through really quick if you look bad. <laughs> There's another temple which is dedicated to Augustus, who is the, the first Caesar, or the second Caesar after Julius. Now Augustus was a really cruel man, he killed lots of people. He had lots of people crucified. His armies were brutal and they'd crucify the enemies. But he thought he was God. These days we'd refer him to a psychiatrist. But in those days they worshipped him. And he didn't look like, I mean, he doesn't look like a God. He doesn't behave like a God, but they worshipped him. And anyone who didn't obey him would be killed. Now I want you to look at what it possibly look like. This is a reconstruction, a photo, CGI reconstruction, a color picture of the city on the hill. Now that looks quite respectable. Beautiful Corinthian and Ionic and other pillars and beautiful architecture, lovely amphitheater, happy, colorful crowds wandering around, laughing, joking, talking. But what I want to do is actually peel back our dimension that we live in of length, breadth, time, and, and, and uh, height, 
and see what's behind this very nice veneer. Because Satan likes to have a very nice veneer for all the stuff he does. He always paints a very nice picture. Let's see what, what is lurking behind this. Because actually Satan is lurking behind it. And the description of Satan that's given is that great dragon, that old snake, the devil, who is Satan. And he looks pretty scary. He's depicted with seven heads and ten horns and ten crowns on his head. And he's got this long tail that drags down one-third of the stars and casts them to the ground. Those were the angels who followed him in his rebellion and are now his minions. You picture him sitting in his armchair. He can puff smoke because he's a dragon. He can do it out of seven mouths. It's great. And his minions are there and he controls them like a general. And he says, you see that little church at the bottom? I want you to sort it out. I want you to attack it until it's destroyed. But the church at Pergamon is holding out. They are standing firm for Jesus. They know they don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of the darkness of this world, spiritual wickedness in high places. They've taken to them the armor of God and they're standing. They've even got the sword of the Spirit. And they're a little bit like this little girl who has three dolls, not one, but three. And it's a really old photo. You can tell, but it's black and white and those dolls. We haven't seen those for a long time unless you collect them. She's got three dolls. And another kid's come up and says, I want your dolly. She glares at them and says, no. And her fists tighten. The word hold is actually the word krateo, which means to hold as strongly as your little hands can. The other kid says, I'll give you a lolly and a teddy bear. Do you want to trade? No. The other little kid pokes her in the eye. No. The other kid pulls her hair. No. The other kid then grabs the dolls and starts tugging. She just tightens her grip and says, no. That's what the church at Pergamon is doing. Satan is trying to make them leave Jesus and leave his name. And they are holding on tight. What does it mean to hold fast to Jesus' name? It means to hold fast to everything about him. His character, his person, the fact that he came down on the cross and died for us and then went back to heaven. All of that is Jesus' name. And we want to hold on to that really tight. Because we know that Jesus humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on the cross. Can you see? Even though this is a sharp passage, it reminds us Jesus died for us on the cross. Wherefore God has also highly exalted him and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, of things in heaven, things in earth, things under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. That's the name we hold on to, the beautiful, the wonderful name of Jesus, the name of the lily of the valley, the name of the rose of Sharon, the name of our beloved, the name that we love above all names. Unto who, we who believe he is precious, we hang on to him. Not because we're powerful, because we hang on by faith. And we know that he's actually the one that's holding us, but he wants us to at least make an effort and show that we're cooperating. So they're held fast to his name, and they have not denied my faith. Now what does it mean they have not denied my faith? It, literally in the Greek it says, you have not divide, denied the faith of me. Okay, and often when the faith has the definite article in front of it, it means the Bible. Okay, so here's the Bible. Now, Thomas Jefferson, the third president of the U.S., when he retired, he had a little hobby. And he took a razor blade, and he starts reading through the Gospels, and it says, Jesus calmed the storm. Oops, I don't like that, but then he'd cut that out. That's a miracle. Threw that away. Comes to another bit, Jesus rose from the dead. Cut that out through it. So he ended up with the Bible. That's, that's actually the Jefferson Bible. And then he did a, it was like a cut and paste. What was left after he really torn it to shreds? Because when you start cutting the miracles and the supernatural out of the Gospels, you're actually left with a pretty thin Bible. So he pasted it all together again. 
And I was tempted to do that today, to say, Lord, this is a tough passage. I think I'll just take a razor blade and leave that bit out. And the Lord was saying, no, these are my words, not your words. You mustn't be afraid to speak my words. So we don't have the right to cut bits out of the Bible. Because if we do, we are saying, Holy Spirit, you didn't inspire this properly. And that bit about feeding of 5,000 with five loaves and two fishes. Pff, come on, who believes that? That bit goes. We're saying to Jesus, your Bible, your word is not good enough. I, in the 20th century, are smarter than you. I can take the bits out. And the church at Pergamon is doing a fantastic job. They have not denied his faith. And Jude tells us that we must fight for the faith, the Bible, that was once for all delivered to the saints. Wow, I'm impressed with this church. They're clinging to the faith. They're not denying Jesus. But now we come to the difficult bit. Jesus said, I've got a few things against you. And I've got a few things against you, even in view of your history. Your history when you stood so firmly, even in the days of my martyr Antipas. Now Antipas was the senior pastor of the church, the leader of the church. And his name is Anti, which means against, and Pass, which means everybody. Which means he ended up being against everybody. Because the Romans said to him, you must stop preaching about idols and that it's bad to pray to idols because our business is suffering. He said, no. They said, please, just offer a little incense to the Caesar as God and a little offering of wine to him and it will be fine. He said, no. They dragged him up the steps of that altar of Zeus, got to the top of the steps where the sacrifices were made, and they had a big copper bull. And it was hollow on the inside. And they pushed him inside this copper bull, and they put water in and they put a fire underneath and they boiled him. And all they could hear was his loud prayers to God. So strong has this church been that Antipas was prepared to die rather than surrender his faith. Living in that place where Satan dwells. But Jesus says, I've got a few things against you. He says, I have a few things against you. You hold to the doctrine of Balaam that set a trap. He persuaded Balak to set a trap for the children of Israel. Who's Balaam? What's this trap? What's he talking about? Well, Balaam was a prophet, but actually a sorcerer. He dealt with evil spirits. He dealt with all sorts of the occult and other things. And as this person dealing with the occult um, he said Balak the king came to him and said I can't beat the people of Israel they're too strong for me will you please come and curse them so he set off on his donkey to go and curse the people of Israel and he's riding clippity clop clippity -clop along the don with his donkey and suddenly out of the blue if we could have the next picture please out of the blue he spots well he doesn't spot the donkey fortunately he spots it for him the angel of the Lord with a sword blocking his way. And God says, you shall not curse them, you will bless them. He tries to curse them, but he ends up blessing them. His plan has failed, but he's disappointed. Because Balak promised him promotion to huge power and also offered him anything he wanted. They were talking about a house full of gold and silver. He's greedy and he's missing out on his money. So he comes back to Balak and he says, you know, I've got a plan. I think we're now to get these people. We'll set a trap for them. And the trap will be baited with a woman of Moab. So they take some of the women of the Moab, really pretty women, and they go mincing around past the tents of the men of Israel. Hi, guys. You want to come partying? And, and the men, oh, no, we shouldn't. Oh, we've got wives. We shouldn't be doing this. Oh, it's great. The food up there is fantastic. Oh, food. Well, actually, so like ox 
an ox to the slaughter, they follow these girls up to the top of the hill. Next thing they know, they're tucking into this big meat, meal, but the meat's been offered to idols. Next thing they're taking some drugs which help in their worship at the top of the mountain. And next thing they're having sex with other women and not their wives. And when they wake up, they realize, I've broken commandment number one. You shall have no other gods before me. I've broken commandment number seven. You shall not commit adultery. Oh, and also commandment number ten. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife. Do you see what Balaam's done? He's set the bait. He's trapped these men. These men now go back into Israel and they're going to corrupt it from the inside. Couldn't beat them from the outside, but it's going to corrupt them from the inside. And that's exactly what's happening in Pergamon. Satan couldn't beat them from the outside, but he's going to trap them from the inside. That's the doctrine of Balaam. But he says also the doctrine of the Nicolaitans, which thing I hate. What's he talking about now with the doctrine of the Nicolaitans? This is basically called dualism. Now you need to understand this. Dualism says that you're made of two parts. You've got a body and you've got a soul. Your soul is pure. Your body is filthy. As long as you've got a pure soul, it does not matter what your body does. So you can be sitting in church on Sunday morning, taking communion, singing choruses, singing hymns, listening to the sermon. But last night, you were sleeping with your girlfriend and you're not married. That's called dualism. It says, what I do in my body has nothing to do with my soul. And it's actually creeping into Christian churches all around the world where people say, it's okay, you don't have to worry about all those old morals and other stuff because you're free in Christ. You're free and God is a God of love. And you love, so that's fine. But what did we learn from Colossians 1 verse 27? That you may know the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is seven words. Christ in you, the hope of glory. If we have Christ in us, he's accompanying us wherever we go. So if you're having an affair with another man or another woman, and they're sitting in this part of the church, and you're sitting in that part of the church, and you're enjoying communion, and you don't think your wife knows or your children know, Jesus is inside you. And what you're doing is hurting him because he loves you. And he knows that's not good for you. And he knows that's going to ruin your life. And he wants you to stop. You're breaking his heart. You will be breaking your wife's heart. And you will be breaking your children's hearts. But maybe you say, no, 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 I've never had an affair. But have you had an emotional affair? As you're sitting in church and I'm preaching, you're not really listening. You're thinking about your boss. Such a nice guy. Wow. Really great. We work so well together. And, um, you know, sometimes at work he just gives me that special look. Makes me feel important. And, and every now and then he invites me out for lunch and he talks about his wife and the problems they're having. And he really... He sees me as his counselor, that I can help him through his difficulty. You know, it's so nice that a boss can be humble enough to ask for advice. And he brings me flowers every now and then. And as I'm speaking, you're not really listening because you're looking forward to work tomorrow. When you walk into the office and his face just lights up when he sees you. If that's your situation, let this be Jesus' warning signals. Danger. You're entering a dangerous zone. Turn around, repent, which means turn around and get out of there for your own safety because Jesus loves you and Jesus is in you. And if you don't stop this emotional fear, it's going to lead to more. But maybe some are saying, I've never had an affair, I've never had an emotional affair. What about the movie you're watching last night? R18, you had to type in your PIN number. Some quite explicit sex scenes. And they openly mocked marriage. And the amount of swearing made the army look quite respectable. 
And then you remember the words of Jesus, whoever looks on a woman to lust after her has committed adultery with her in his heart already. I told you this is all about a sword. I told you it's a sharp. It's tough for all of us. It's really tough. Maybe you haven't had any of those issues, and that's wonderful. But is there something that you're holding on to tightly and won't let go? These people were holding on to the, their morality. And Jesus is cross with the church because they're tolerating it. But maybe there's something else you're holding on to. Something that's damaging you, damaging the church, damaging other people. But you love it so much you want to let it go. And you want to hold on to Jesus, but you also want to hold on to this thing that you really enjoy. You know what's going to happen? Jesus is going this way, and this thing is going that way. And you're going to split down the middle unless you decide, I'm going to let go of that and hold on to Jesus. Or I'm going to leave Jesus because I really love this little thing that I'm doing. We need to take hold of Jesus with both hands of faith. Jesus doesn't like passengers in his jersey. He doesn't like 95% but 5%. I mean, that's like loving your wife 95%, but the other 5%, you know, there's other people that are important. Christianity is 100%. We love Jesus 100%. He loved us 100%. He died on the cross for us. He looks after us every day, even enough to stop us running into the traffic. That's the response from our hearts. Jesus says, repent. And he's telling the church to repent. Do you know the church in Corinth? You read 1 Corinthians chapter 5. It was common knowledge in the town that there was a man in this church that was sleeping with his stepmother. And the church was boasting about it. We're so tolerant. We're so forgiving. We're so loving. We're so kind. And he was having communion with all the other people in the church and yet openly having an affair with his stepmother. And Paul says, how can you boast about this? Your boasting's not good. Don't you know that a little bit of yeast spreads through the whole loaf of bread? If you allow that yeast to keep going, those of you who do sourdough bread know that eventually it all ends up sourdough. And Jesus is saying to the church, sort out that problem. Because if you don't, scary words, I will come to you quickly. And fight not against the church, but against them. He says, for their own good, for those people's own good, sort the problem out. And in 2 Corinthians, they had done the right thing and they had sorted the problem out. And now he says, please forgive that person in case he gets swallowed up with too much sorrow. And that's the beauty of Christianity. Christianity is tough on sin, but very kind to sinners. Do you know the world is very lenient to sin? but incredibly tough to sinners. The same magazine that two months ago said you were the most famous film star in the world is now laughing about your failure. Jesus is the other way around. He says, I love you when I'm um, trying to correct you and I love you when you're close to me. And I don't change my attitude one moment. Like the prodigal son, when he was away in a far country, the father loved him every day and wanted to do anything for him to come back. So Jesus is saying repent, not an angry repent. He's saying a loving repent. Turn around, come back to me. I'm, I'm missing you. I really want you back in my life. But it's up to us because it says in verse 17, he that has an ear to hear, let him hear. Do you know sometimes we have this, you know when you mute the ads, as I'm preaching the sermon, maybe you're pressing the mute button. Didn't want to hear that, but unmute on, he's still on about fornication. Hit the button again. Down a bit, oh, it's a sword again. Hit the button again. Jesus said, if you've got an ear to hear, you've got to listen. No selective deafness. No, oh, my hearing ad fell off at that point. I didn't hear that, but every bit is for us. And now the good news starts. Phew. Have a deep breath and relax. We're through the worst. Jesus says to those who overcome, I will give to eat of the hidden manna. There was some manna that was hidden inside a golden pot inside 
the Ark of the Covenant, which was a solid gold box. It was hidden. But Jesus says, to the one that overcomes, I will give to eat of that hidden manna. And he refers back to a story in the Old Testament when the people were starving and they complained to God. We as people love to complain. The ne that night, God rained down bread from heaven. In the morning, it looked like a heavy frost. They went down and had a look and they said, this is manna, which means I have no idea what this is. <laughs> they picked it up. Thank you, I'm glad you got that translation. Picked it up. It was like a little coriander seed. Tasted it. Wow. It's like wafers and honey. And for 40 years, they survived on the manna. Still didn't know what it was, but they enjoyed it. And Jesus said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. That time when men ate angels' food. He that believes in me shall never hunger. And he that follows me shall never thirst. Jesus is that hidden manna, hidden in the gold pot in the presence of God. And if we overcome, we will enjoy satisfaction in our soul. You know, people who live a promiscuous life are not happy. They like to say they're happy. They like to show in movies that they're happy. But they're often very miserable. But those of us who feast on Christ and on that manna from heaven, that angel's food, our souls are satisfied. And that satisfaction goes through not just for our life, but for all eternity. We enjoy the satisfaction of Christ in us, the hope of glory. But you've been saying you've done the sword and you've done the seat. What about the stone? Well, I hid it in my pocket like the hidden manna. You see, this is the stone. This comes from Orkney where there's a prehistoric little village and there's these grey stones and they've made the stone and they've written their Scarabray, which was the name of the little place where they stayed. But the one that we're promised is not a grey stone, but a white stone. And on it, a name written, a new name, which no one knows except the person who's given that name. What's he talking now, now, there are lots of different views as to what this white stone could be. It seems to be the majority of commentators say that this is actually an invitation to a wedding or a feast. So one day you're sitting at home, and along comes a stone mail, and they deliver a stone for you. And the white stone has got written on, this is your name, and you're invited to this feast. So on the day of the feast, you have a bath, you put on your best toga and off you go to this fancy feast. When you arrive at the door, the official of the door says, can I please see your invitation stone? Oh, just a minute, I've got it somewhere here in my pocket. Oh, yeah, here we go. This is it. It says Scarra Bray. Oh, very good, sir. Very good, madam. Come this way. And they take you through to this beautiful seat, to a table laden with food. The other night we had one of those feasts, absolutely stunning. Wonderful fellowship, wonderful company, amazing food. Jesus says, I'm giving you an invitation to a feast that won't just be over within a couple of hours and then you're hungry in the morning. It's the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven. And happy are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb because you'll have that white stone and a new name written. And I love that idea of a new name written. What does Satan do? His Antichrist put 666 in everybody's forehead. For Satan, we're all just numbers. He doesn't care about our names or how important we are or are we married or where do we work or what. He doesn't care. He just says, you're another number in my army. Sign up. For Jesus, he's got a special name, a new name. Not even the name you're called by now, but he's got a special name for you. And one day in heaven when he calls that name, you'll say, yes, that's me. Thank you. I'm coming forward. Thank you. Of all the millions of Christians in heaven and all the angels in heaven, he says, you are unique. You are special. I've got a special name for you. So that is the good news. To those who overcome, will be given the stone. Jesus started this letter saying, I know your works and I know where you stay with Satan's seat is. But now he says, I know your works and I know your name and I know where you stay in heaven where my seat is. You see, we started with a sword. 
the sword of Jesus, with which he conquered Satan, with which he will judge the people that have given everyone else such a hard time. We went on to a throne, Satan's throne, but Jesus with his sword conquered Satan. Then we ended up with, again in my pocket, the stone. For those who overcome through Christ, through the sword, through the blood of the Lamb and their testimony are given the stone and will enjoy that feast forever. May God give us the strength and the wisdom to overcome so that we may enjoy that feast one day. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, thank you that you love us so much that you don't leave us when we're running across the street. You don't leave us when we're playing with guns that are loaded. You say, repent, turn away, come back to me and drop that thing. And Lord, we pray today of you telling us there's something that you're holding on to that's more important to you than Jesus. Lord, in these quiet moments and as we sing and as we reflect, may we say, yes, Lord, I'm going to drop that thing. I want to hang on to you with two hands. I want you to be my 100% ruler and the most important person in my life. Lord, just move in our hearts as we worship you. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, amen.